In an age when advertisements can be withdrawn for misrepresentation and political claims can be fact-checked, shouldn't religious propaganda be subjected to the same critical analysis? This is Thought for the Day Debunked. You are listening to a programme from BBC Radio 4. The Reverend Dr Giles Fraser, Rector of St Mary Newington. Good morning. It was on this day in 1844 that Charles Darwin wrote probably his most famous letter to his best friend Joseph Hooker, in which he began tentatively to explain his ideas about natural selection. It's like confessing to a murder, Darwin wrote. And for many in the coming decades, the victim of this murder was none other than the Almighty himself. Notice that the Almighty is cast as the victim, despite there being no evidence for his actual existence. Sixteen years later, Hooker was also there at that famous argument between Bishop Wilberforce and Thomas Huxley that set the tone for the whole of the Victorian debate about science and religion. The bishop asked Huxley if he was descended from an ape on his mother or his father's side, and Huxley... The tone is obviously being set by the bishop with his deliberately ridiculing question. And this is a cherry-picked quote. Let's tell the full story. Huxley is said to have replied that he would not be ashamed to have a monkey for his ancestor, but he would be ashamed to be connected with a man who used his great gifts to obscure the truth. Huxley, like many of his scientific friends, developed a visceral dislike of the Church of England and of its unwarranted sense of intellectual privilege. A justifiably visceral dislike of the Church of England, wouldn't you say? But I wonder if things are slowly changing, that one of the unexpected consequences of the last few years, both because of COVID and the climate emergency, is that science and religion are creeping towards a more nuanced relationship. Creeping towards a more nuanced relationship? What does he mean by religion in this context? Does he mean Islam? I doubt it. It's high time to forget the phony war between faith and science, wrote Rowan Williams in The Guardian over the weekend, and he's right. Of course, former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, would like to style the relationship between faith and science as a phony war. If it's a real war, he's on the losing side. For one thing, the climate emergency requires us all to pull together. There are nearly 8 billion people who call this earth their home, and the overwhelming majority have some sort of faith. 2.3 billion Christians, nearly 2 billion Muslims, over a billion Hindus and so on. These are very dubious old estimates. Recent polls and censuses tell a very different story. Many people who traditionally have ticked the box for membership of a faith are now admitting that they don't actually practice it, and many are openly leaving their faith. He claims that they are growing. The evidence shows the opposite trend. Globally, faith is growing, and it remains one of the most effective delivery mechanisms for our ethical values. This means that the acrimony... Only because he claims to have ownership of ethical values. That's theft. ...between science and religion is a very dangerous distraction from the existential challenge of our generation. And the truth is, Darwin's confession of murder was always a tad overdramatic. God survived. There'll always be people who look out of their window and reach for the language of creation to describe what they see, and there will always be those who use the more sober language of natural science. Yes, there may always be people who believe in creation. And he's right. Science does use more sober language. That's good, not bad. I think of both perspectives as two very different aspects of human experience, equally important. Equally important? How can that be when one is evidential and the other isn't? Others will disagree, of course. But nonetheless, what seems to have been happening over the last few years is that more and more people of faith and people of science 
have been lining up alongside each other, side by side, both concerned with the same thing, out there on the same demonstrations, calling for the same action to be taken. Only because the representatives of the established church in this country have traditionally been consulted and offered a microphone. Not because they bring any expertise to bear on the issues in question, like the pandemic and climate change. That's why we line up alongside. Of course, we will always approach the climate emergency with a variety of different ways to describe our ultimate values. But the one thing that binds us together, especially now, is that whether you measure it or you pray for it or both, we're all talking about the same world. That tired old argument is a luxury we can no longer afford. Now is the time for a reset of the relationship. And just perhaps it's happening already. Yes, it is a time for a reset. We should call them out for the imposters that they are. Their access to the platform is unjustified.